much of my talk is about how often good care for trans and non-binary people around conception, pregnancy, uh, birth, and then postnatal care is fr quite frankly the fruits of our own labor. And I feel like you have both done a fabulous job at demonstrating that and really setting that up um, and, and saying, yes, this is how this goes. So I want to start with locating myself, and it's going to be a long location, so please bear with me. Uh, I'm a trans person. I'm a parent of three. Uh, I've been pregnant and birthed two of my children. One of my children identifies as non-binary. My PhD work is with young children, zero to six, and their caregivers, looking at ways we can co-create drop-in spaces as both queer and transcultural spaces. And my professional work has been around pushing institutions to create more room and welcome for people of all genders at both levels of individual advocacy and policy creation. So I really want to say, like, this is kind of the space I live in all the time and in all the aspects. Um, I recognize that I've been rewarded and advantaged by my whiteness, my citizenships, my perceived abilities, and my English language competency, and more. I've also been systemically disadvantaged by fat phobia, transphobia, homophobia, and more. But those same identities that the systems marginalize have brought me into communities with a range of fabulous humans who become my friends and my family and my communities. I'm committed to recognizing people as experts in their own lives and as an individual, uh, the individual is the ultimate uh, source of knowledge on themselves. I am resistant to both medical and state systems that attempt to define us or that attempt to tell us what we can and cannot do with our own bodies. So my commitment is to individual agency and working to maximize that. I'm committed to definitions that are both broad and specific. So for example, uh, transition processes are defined by the individual. And it makes sense to me to qualify medical transition when we mean that because it makes it clear that transition is not automatically a medical process. It might be, or it might not. The term fully transitioned is one I avoid as hierarchical, assumptive, and meaningless. Um, I recognize that both medical and state systems are systems of control, and that my own context of Canada and other Western contexts both are dominated by whiteness, cisness, heterosexuality, class bias and ableism, and that these inform who is considered valid and who is disposable, who is recorded, who is ignored, who might receive services, and who is considered other or unacceptable, and as a result, pathologized or criminalized. It feels essential to pay attention to these and seek to overturn such systems. I do not believe that we are defined by our governmental ID not by the names on them, not by the sex gender markers on them, not by the familial roles on them, not by the nationalities proclaimed by them. I do believe that all of us should be able to access ID that affirms our knowledge of ourselves, and that attempting to do so can often consume huge amounts of time and money and resources. I have no judgment on choosing to engage or disengage with such processes. At the same time, I affirm individual choices to engage in state and medical systems for our own purposes. Many of us have made and will continue to make choices to engage with systems we know are oppressive for the purposes of our own goals. This is particularly true in terms of medical transition and medical processes around conception and pregnancy and birth. And I do not believe the choices to engage with and in systems are in any way an endorsement of them. So that's a lot but that's sort of the, the framing and what I come into this with. Um, so before we talk about engaging clinics and providers, I want to really make us clear that we're part of a community that stretches through time as well as through space. Uh, and in doing so and facilitating connections, I want us to let go of the first as a term. And I, and I think we use the first a lot, and we use the first with a lot of qualifiers the first nationality, the first with twins. Uh, there's a whole lot of firsts. And I want us to say we are all the first. We are the first to imagine ourselves into the lives we live. We are the first to birth our children. I feel very comfortable with the idea of personal firsts and far less comfortable with national or international. And while stories of the first 
whatever relevant qualifier is relevant here, have been a significant force in creating pregnant men as a culturally known phenomenon, I'd like us to resist them. And here's some of the lies. So the first makes others invisible and makes them hard to access and hard to find their stories. And it was striking to me yesterday at the opening of the conference, Sally shared a picture uh, of Matt uh, Rice and his baby. And when I talked to Matt about that story, Matt shared that after that was published, he found that other F2Ms, and that's the language he used, who had or who wanted to have children reached out to him at his publication. So we put up that story as an early dating one, and Matt himself says, yes, the invisible helped me find other people before me. Reaching out to Matt was a source of knowledge building for me and community building. And it was Matt who told me that his child is perfect. And then after talking about how hard their first years were, when his child would vomit everything he ate, ate the challenges of being non-neurotypical in a world that assumes we are all neurotypical, I had to ask him what he meant. And Matt assured me that his child is perfectly himself, and that his parenting was about recognizing the perfection of his child. When I facilitated transmasculine people considering pregnancy as a course in Toronto for the LGBTQ Parenting Network, Matt was able to video chat with participants and connect with them and connect them with others. When we let go of the first, we have communities through time. The obscuring of history is part of an unfortunate and larger trend in some trans communities. Many trans men have not grown up in trans communities or with much knowledge of trans cultures, and this lack of knowledge means that some trans men come out and experience trans communities as if they emerge with them. Trans guys who've been out for longer often feel hurt or overlooked, ignored, even by the newcomers that they've helped support. First can be interpreted at the same time as a call for help, a way of marking that something was really hard and that we had to do it without a roadmap. It's like saying, at this fixed point, I needed help and it wasn't received. And it's a way of focusing on one person's challenges. What if we could find ways of providing help in those moments instead? The first makes things into a contest and a conquest, and begets a second, and then regional firsts. It also puts it at risk to a media that sees us as interesting, but not necessarily for our own reasons. And so in February of 2012, I had a call from a, a writer here in the UK who said, hi, I'm desperately trying to get in touch, because someone who may be one of your online friends just got outed big time in the UK press and doesn't know about it yet. I'm going to drop you an email too and try to call. I'm a UK journalist and trans activist, so you can mistrust me for the first bit. If you make a few inquiries, you'll find them solid as far as anything else that touches the trans community. I'd like to message this individual. Nothing more, but he needs a warning that the media circus is about to descend if he doesn't know already. So the message was in regards to a trans man who had given birth and who was about to be declared in the media against his wishes and at considerable personal cost as quote, the first British trans man to give birth. Titles like the first make events like that possible. They make us into a scoop. So I'm going to flip time a fair chunk. And I'm going to start with 1353. <laughs> As a child, I was fascinated by Pope John Anglicus. Although, to be fair, I didn't know him by that name. What I read then portrayed him as a woman, and the idea of a woman as the head of the Roman Catholic Church felt titillating, exciting, and feminist. Leaving aside whether or not there ever was such a person, I'd like to reconsider who this person might have been in either history or story. John Anglicus has been so thoroughly and frequently deadnamed that I need to break with proper trans protocol just once and share his dead name because you probably know him better as Pope Joan. In using the familiar name, we decide that the act of giving birth is a reveal of sex. More significant than the individual's chosen name or gender, his chosen dress, or his career path, which was only open to men. What if instead we had all read the story of Pope John Anglicus, a pious and clever man who happened to be identified female at birth, but who established himself as a student and rose the level of Pope? Part of the story is a man's pregnancy with a pro briefly a pregnant man who gave birth and then was killed for doing so. It's an awful ending. 
In using the familiar name, we side with the murderous mob. But what if, if Western's culture history of male pregnancy began in the medieval period, and we acknowledge that there is nothing new about trans men becoming pregnant and giving birth? And in fact, what we need is care. Robert Zapiri is invested in this past. In Pregnant Man, he's collected Italian, and to some lesser extent European, religious images of pregnant men, cultural tales, folklore, and what in some cases is basically gossip from the 13th century through the late 19th. He describes Adam as the first pregnant man who gave birth to a fully formed Eve through his side. And so in pictures like this, he describes it as like God doing a C-section which I think is pretty fabulous. And, and as someone who really wants like, historical pictures of pregnant men, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, stories of blood and urine of men being swapped for that of someone who's pregnant, and thus a man being diagnosed as pregnant by physicians, which is what's happening in this picture. And stories where a beetle enters a man's anus and the movement of the beetle causes the man to believe he's pregnant. Both of these last two versions of men believing they're pregnant are described as two um, Alsopian fables. So I don't know if you grew up with Alsop's fables. These were never included in the ones that I got as a child. <laughs> um, Zapiri writes, but why should this objective be pursued by insisting on the story of a pregnant man? And in both fables, there can be only one answer. The theme was very widespread. He writes also that despite there being a widespread nature of stories and images of pregnant men, or men who believe they are pregnant, we shouldn't regard them as condoning the possibility. In all the stories, the men are believed they're pregnant, and the stories function to mock the pregnant man and reinforce the sexual differences between men and women. Still, he writes that in the Sicily of the 19th century, there was still a proverb in common use which ran, anything can happen except a pregnant man. And even then, there's the pregnant man of Montreal. So what does it mean to have the image of a pregnant man so entrenched in culture as an impossibility? What does it mean for actual pregnant men whose existence overturns centuries of folk tales? When pregnant men have been so linked to stupidity for so long, what does it mean to claim that identity? Sapiri's work gathers for us a history of tales of pregnant men, but one where they're not often true. It is, however, often true that when we're looking for a history of gender outlaws, that history is an uncomfortable one because we've not done the telling ourselves. So I want to skip to, we're moving forward through time pretty rapidly, so we're now at 1631. So in male delivery, reproduction, effemacy, and pregnant men in early modern Spain, Sherry Velasco details similar Spanish stories of men who believe they are pregnant and believe they gave birth to foxes or hares or calves. She, ever includes, she also includes actual people and writes, in Spain, tales of pregnant men began to appear in the Middle Ages and have continued to circulate for centuries through oral storytelling. Velasco also introduces the idea of uh, Sebastián de Corobles, emblas morales, moral emblems, and the pictorial image representing androgyny portrays this picture. Um, which in English gets discussed as a bearded lady, but that's not how it's written about in Spanish. So I, I want you to know that the motto in Spanish on the back of it was neither and both, um, which is one that I find much more personal resonance with. The text emphasizes a third possibility that is simultaneously neither and both male and female, um, but we have no writing from the individual uh, themselves. So it's striking to me that despite the original text describing individuals both and neither, Valesco has rendered them a bearded woman, which seems in line with her recurring theme that men are in, or who are interested in pregnancy are interested instead in usurping woman's power. Neither and both, a feminado, a bearded woman, we have other people's descriptions of Magdalena Ventura, but nothing to indicate how Ventura conceived their own identity. <coughs> and launched towards this person, I'm left admiring the painting deeply desiring to know how the person pictured interpreted their own sex and gender, and frankly struck by our similar physicalities. Valesco also introduced me to Eleno Descasticida, who in 1586 was declared legally male by physician Francisco Diaz, and here we have a person who gave birth, and then left a husband, took on male clothing and male professions, had sex with women as men, 
I'm not sure why that's always an important qualification, but it is, apparently, uh, was declared a man legally and married a woman. Uh, well, Des Sesta was not male at the time of his pregnancy, he does offer a historic possibility that is real and documented and not presented as comedy. Pregnancy and birthing in the Western tradition has commonly been the domain of women, but it's never exclusively belonged to women. The traces are there, and even when the traces have reinforced rigid binary sex roles or served as a caution, some of us can see possibility along with the caution. So I'm going to sort of fly forward through time. Uh, and as men who've been pregnant, we have a history of training our providers, and one that mirrors a history of trans people seeking medical uh, transition services. So we have funded research into our own care. And the most common example often given is the Erickson Educational Foundation, which funded a lot of money's initial research at John Hopkins. But I want to think of all of the time that any of us have put volunteer-wise into assisting any of our service providers better understand what they might be doing. Because uh, that also counts. We have brought forward our own protocols. We have advocated for appropriate care. We have advocated for and participated in community advisories. We have formed networks among ourselves to share knowledge and resources. We have edited and corrected forms, intake processes, language, and promotional materials. We have trained our own service providers. We have trained other service providers. We have demanded our care providers train others. We have offered images of ourselves and our families for training and for signaling purposes. I think there's a couple of really useful things that come out of uh, Julian Gail Patterson's book and uh, things that I think we really should carry. Actually, I think there's a lot of really useful things, but there's a couple I want to highlight here. Uh, so first I want to say it's about trans children and how trans children have really shaped trans care in North America and particularly what happens in clinics. But I want us to think about how um, keeping us out of that history keeps us infantilized. It lets clinicians hold the story rather than people who are trans and not clinicians. Um, that seeing trans people as active participants in the construction and contestation of medical discourse in this way uh, is essential and puts us back into the story as our own narrators. I appreciate the acknowledgement that the frequent absence of black trans people and trans people of color in the clinic's archive in particular is not only a product of medical gatekeeping or of the whiteness of transsexuality, but it's a product of the distance practiced by black trans people and trans people of color from institutional medicine, which was often understood, and is still often understood, to be dangerous and frequently a violent apparatus. And so I, I think yesterday in some of our conversations about whiteness, and I think that's an answer that we need to carry with us and think about, and how do we um, address that in our research and work. And Juliet also gives us the question of, we're left to wonder just how many more trans people have no reason at all to be archived, and what happens when we get left out. We have taken on training our providers, um, even at the risk of our own fears. In a 1998 German study of FTM transsexuals conducted by Sam Dylan Moore, he found that the negative attitudes of both therapists and medical professionals that, um, that pregnancy and birth represented a contraindication to the diagnosis of transsexuality proved to be one of the most prominent stress factors during pregnancy. And so to name your, your care provider's attitudes as the most significant factor above that of losing custody or being denied the option to transition or fear of being perceived as female or anxieties around promotion uh, of options with employers um, feels really significant to me and speaks to a need for a broader community response. I find it in films like Jewel Roscombe's Transparent and Sin Love Now's a Womb of Their Own. It's in organizations taking on the work of training their own members the way the Ontario Midwifery Association did in 2011. And the poster on the left is uh, their poster and I was one of the folks they brought into training with a wide range of people. It allows for attention to the experiences of trans men to be studied and understood, and ideally for changes to be made to better things for all. Recognizing that pregnancy or biological children is something trans men are interested in allows us to push people supporting people in transition to provide full information about the possible risk to fertility, options for fertility preserving and preservation pre-transition, possibilities for research into fertility post-transition. In short, building community allows for the improvements for a much broader group. 
Alex Abramovich wrote in The Advocate about his experience of re repeated transphobia while accessing fertility services at a major Toronto hospital. The very headline of the article, Trans Men Need the Competent Fertility Care I Never Got, speaks not of the singularity and uniqueness of his experience, but of its commonality. In the article and the subsequent CBC interview, Alex kept the focus on the experience as a whole and the potential impact on any trans man seeking these services and demanded the hospital make changes. He used his experience to build compassion and understanding for all trans men and any who might hope to have a child using his own eggs. One person focused on their experience, humanizing a broader cohort to which they belong, and then leveraging their experience and privilege for the betterment of others. And who in doing so created the possibility for greater training at the same hospital. And then two years later, another trans man, uh, so Kinnan at the bottom, having a very different experience. And Kinnan wrote uh, an article with the title, not all trans people have access to freezing embryos. I'm one of the lucky ones. I want to end with the work of another trans dad. Cyrus Marcus Ware uh, has contributed lots to trans community in Toronto and to trans parenting in Toronto. But what I want to highlight is an art project called Love Letters to Activists. In this project, he encourages people to write literal love letters to the activists they admire, and he both displays them and sends them. It feels like an essential part of community that we know just how to train those who provide us for service, but we also need to honor and thank the people who've done the labor of getting us to this place of possibility. I want to encourage all of us here to think of the trans and non-binary parents who've made new possibilities in our own lives and to write them a note. It doesn't have to be on paper. You know, I think a text is fine. But let's include in our practice honoring each other in the work and recognizing how we build community for each other. Thank you.